this evening we're going to speak about uh, the secret of right action. And this is a very important topic, of course, because I think all of us naturally want to do the right thing. If we're devotees, of course, we want to do the right thing. We want to serve, we want to um, be of use for others, but we want to also make the right decisions that's going to serve our own personal interests so that we're happy in life. And so naturally, every day, in some small way, we're asking inwardly that question, what should I do? What's the right thing to do? What's the right action to take? And so we think of it in terms of our personal life, but also I suspect that many of us also feel a larger sense of purpose for how can we serve outwardly? How can we make this world a better place? How do we have some higher purpose just beyond our individual uh, lives that we lead? And if we do, what do we do? What is what is the higher dharma uh, for each of us to express that dharma out into the world? And I have gone through uh, in my lifetime times when I've had, it's been a very important question for me. Many years ago, oh, I, should, I hate to say many, but it, it turns out it has been many years now, time has flown. But years ago, before I came on to the spiritual uh, search, uh, consciously at least, and before I met Swami Kriyananda and before I read the autobiography of a yogi. I was a university student in California and uh, at that time I had an inner, inner desire. I wanted to do something, I wanted to serve, and I felt there was a need to uh, express myself in some way outwardly in the right way. And in those days, this would have been in the 1960s, in the middle of the 1960s in, in the United States, it was a time of social unrest. The country at that time had engaged in a war in Vietnam. The, uh, there, was a, there was a great deal of unrest civilly in terms of civil rights, uh, racial equality, voting, uh, 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 fairness. All of these things of social turmoil were happening at a time when I was coming of age, at, at a time when I was a university student. So naturally, I became caught up in that. And usually, as is the case, when a person is young, they're very idealistic and uh, they want to they participate often uh, in, uh, in those sorts of things. And so I was no different from that. And, and so I was also at a school at that time, which was very active in those ways. This would have been in Berkeley, California. And as things would, I had at that time, uh, I had become also simultaneously interested in spiritual teachings of the East. I had uh, read about uh, the life of Buddha. I was uh, interested in, in exploring what was Zen uh, meditation about, although I didn't practice. The theory of the thought of it was more about as much as I could do in those days. And, but at the same time, I also read the Bhagavad Gita. And I, I immediately I recognized it was a very beautiful book and had lots of wisdom in it, but I was not taken to it because uh, you come to the part very early in the book where Krishna advises Arjuna to fight this battle. And at that time, I was very much engaged in political activity of trying to stop the fighting in that America was engaged in at that time in Vietnam. And so I was, I was taken aback by that and I put the book aside. I was more interested in the writings of Mahatma Gandhi. I read his autobiography, I read other things about him and by him, and I was very taken with him and his approach of, of uh, nonviolence, uh, satyagraha. But I have to admit, looking back these many years, that just as I did not understand the Bhagavad Gita beyond the surface, because there's obviously, it, I, as I learned, and as often we teach in these classes, there's a much deeper meaning to what Krishna was saying just beyond the surface. But even on the surface, there's a truth to what he was saying as well. Similarly, with, with, with Gandhi, it's more than just being passively resistant or nonviolent. This has to be taken inside. But at that time, 
those were truths that was that were a little bit beyond my experience and so uh, I, but nevertheless, I took them on the surface. I was very much attracted to it. And as one thing would lead to another, in those days there were many demonstrations, and I found myself participating in these demonstrations and uh, ended up in jail. At that time, I spent 10 days in jail uh, at a, as a result of a nonviolent protest that I was engaged in with some others. Well, in jail with me were approximately another 200, 300 people. And so we had a very lovely time spending 10 days together in the county jail. Well, this was a very instructive lesson for me. I didn't mind being incarcerated. There were a few people there that uh, I came to admire quite greatly because they were, they were very dedicated to the ideals. But there were also a great number of people there that I absolutely came to see uh, how shallow they were. They were egotistical. They were, uh, they were immature. They were, uh, they were childish in their behavior, their understanding of, of a deeper purpose of what was trying to be expressed in our demonstration. They, it was went totally by them. You might say they were participating because it seemed like a fun thing to do. And there was underneath their motivations, there was, there was anger also. There, were ang there was restlessness, not peace at all. And so as I came out of that experience after my 10 days with these other fellows, it made me introspect and I came to realize very seriously that outwardly, how can we have peace in this world? How can we make these changes if I myself, within myself, don't have that peace? And I realize that much of, of changing things outwardly politically is not going to be effective. It's merely reshuffling of the deck of cards unless there is some inner change that also needs to take place. And so it, it drove me in a direction of abandoning that path to taking another of inner exploration that how can I uh, find in myself and experience for myself those truths that of which Gandhi was speaking about and that that inner strength, that inner courage, that inner peace that then will inform my actions. Gandhi advised that in order to truly practice nonviolence, one has to also practice love within one's heart. One has to embrace other people in love and that when you feel that love, then naturally the outer expression of what you is, are going to do is going to be peaceful. So I began to look to a deeper uh, teaching to uh, pursue for myself, but I also then felt that if we're going to change this world, I need to become peaceful, and then how can I share that with other people? Maybe I could get together with other people and we could together in that consciousness go out and share that, and perhaps then more significant change might take place. And it was from those actions that not much longer after that, I then came across the autobiography of Yogi. I then came across uh, uh, from that meeting Swami Kriyananda. And from that, Swamiji, I began to participate with Swamiji in his efforts to uh, actualize an ideal of Paramahansa Yogananda's, which was the creation of cooperative villages, spiritual communities. And so one thing led to another and I said, yes, this is something that we could, I could actually participate in. Let's see if I can change. I can begin to express that. And then joining with my fellows, we can together create an example to help change others in our little way. This is a big world, but each of us can begin within our own selves. The, some years ago, 
oh, probably somewhere in the 1980s, I suspect, if I remember right. Swami Kriyananda was on a tour, lecture tour, and he was in um, Great Britain at that time, somewhere in England, I believe it was, could have been Scotland, but in the north. And he was invited to a religious conference in which religious leaders from different groups were speaking about religion in the modern age, the, the modern, how religion can be meaningful in today's age with, uh, uh, with the public at large and how we, religion might embrace more people and bring them, uh, uh, touch people's lives. So Swamiji was invited to this conference and there were many speakers and one man was Rose who was a um, quite a high up person in the Church of England spoke immediately prior to Swamiji and this man took the position that religion needed to be made meaningful in the modern age that, that uh, the, the past was no longer appropriate to the traditional forms that religion had taken. And his, uh, the words I remember Swami repeating uh, of this man's discourse were, religion in the modern age must be politicized. We must get out into the poor, with, uh, helping the poor, changing the social conditions of England and politicize religion to make it meaningful in this modern age. Well, okay, he gave that. Uh, his, his, his approach was that we must take it out of the churches and into the streets and uh, affect social change. And this would be the focus of modern religion that would, that would inspire people to, because uh, the Church of England, of course, as you know, is, uh, is um, somewhat becoming dead. And Swamiji then rose to speak after this man, and he got up and very, uh, you know, humbly said, well, uh, thank you, uh, but uh, I beg to differ. <laughs> I have an alternate point of view. And not that what this man necessarily was saying. He was necessarily, if a person feels inwardly called, just as I was when I was a student in, in college, inwardly called to go out in some way, express my idealism to help other people and to change the world and, you might say, to follow the politicized path, not necessarily that there's anything wrong with that, but and so consequent, he wasn't he wasn't saying that was a bad thing to do, but the topic here was what is the highest action. And then the topic of what we're speaking about, what is the secret of right action, and our and particularly when we're talking about the highest action in religion, as the conference was was addressing. He said, and Swami pointed out that man's highest duty is not to help the poor or fix social conditions or even to bring peace out into the world, which are all noble and good objectives. Man's highest duty is to find God. And that is the starting point that a discussion of what is the role of religion in the modern age must begin. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. And this is uh, in with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all of our strength. We start there, and then we express that in some way, but without first finding or, or setting that uh, goal correctly within ourselves, the others will be merely a reshuffling of worldly consciousness. We'll bring that consciousness into whatever our actions are. And so he, be, he begged to differ very respectfully. And so he said, what we should do is our duty 
as souls. Our duty as children of God is to love our Father. In, in, and then, with that love, express it outwardly. But each of us individually needs to find the appropriate way to express that. And it, is, it will differ for each one of us according to our karma, our individual talents, our individual uh, 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 abilities to be able to reach out. Each of us will have to find that way which inspires us. And he says it's much rather than taking our directives from what another person feels is the socially responsible thing to do, we need to, each of us, look within ourselves and find what inspires us to be able to share that supreme duty that we have with other people. And so, yes, some people will be inspired to help others in, in this fashion or that fashion. Some people will be inspired to help others through service. Some people will be inspired to help others through sharing God's joy. Each of us has to find that, what is, what is going to be inspirational for us. There, uh, many of you know the story of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And it's, uh, she's now only not been long since she passed, and she was a great woman. And if you are to ask somebody, and perhaps yourself, I ask you, what is she most remembered for? It's because she worked to serve the downtrodden, the lowest of the low in Calcutta, taking people that were dying off the streets and bringing, bringing them into hospice care in the last years of their life or the last perhaps moments of their life, days or moments, and serving them with love. Beautiful work. She did, it was a very great work that she did, and many people were inspired from around the world to come to her mission, which still is there in Calcutta, and to serve that work. And it's an admirable thing, a beautiful thing that she did. But one part of her mission, or one aspect of it that sometimes people forget, is that when a person asked her once, and this is a documentary of her life that, was, that I had seen that was on film. The documentary of her life was, uh, in this documentary, a, the interviewer asked her, why? Why did she do this? Her life had been dedicated to something, and what was her life about, and what was the purpose of all of this? And she could have answered that in many ways. I wanted to serve the poor. Uh, the poor, uh, the dying needed help, and I saw it and I responded to it. She could have answered in those ways, and it would have been well understood, but she didn't. She said, I did, I've done what I've done because it was what Christ asked me to do. And that is a very significant answer. She did what she did because it was her way of responding to what she felt God, in this case in the form of Christ, was asking of her. She wanted to please God. That was her motivation. And in that pleasing, she did, the question naturally comes, How will I please you, Lord? What can I do to please you? What can I do to love you? What can I do to express uh, the, uh, that, uh, that beauty of, of the divine beauty out into the world? And Christ led her to Calcutta to serving the downtrodden there, the, the people that were dying. And she said, yes, this, is, this I can do. But you see, her motivation, yes, she loved, loved the people she served. Yes. She loved that work, and yes, she knew it was, it was a, a beautiful thing in itself, but her motivation was to serve God. And this is how we need to pick up our lives, is when we're asking, what is right action? If you're wanting to express it, if you're asking that question of how should we express this out in the world, what is that right action? Pick it up, your life up, and that question up from the highest. How can I serve God? 
What is, what is going to be meaningful to God? And when we internalize that question inwardly, because intuitively we're asking every day, what should I do, Lord? What, what is, should I do this, take this course of action? Should I take that course of action? We have to understand the goal that we're trying to move ourselves toward. Do those things. Choose those things that take you toward inner freedom. Take you toward divine harmony. Take you toward that oneness of, with God. Take you to that goal which is the common goal, whether we know it or not, of all of us. Union with God. Back to that oneness. And what action do I take that will take me there? Now, I say freedom, a sense of freedom, inner freedom, because to oneness with God is such a broad term, a grand term, it's hard to internalize that and, or hard to express that. How do I express that? But what takes you to a sense of inner freedom? Now, I'd like to share with you today, this, after, this evening, I'd like to share with you a few suggestions because, yes, we can outwardly, each of you in your own way, will need to find uh, uh, an outward expression for what you choose to do. Some of you may be, may be artists, you may be businessmen, you may be, you may be sort of service workers of some sort or another. Each of you, what, what is it? that gives you inspiration and what is going to, in your action, going to lead you to a sense of freedom and to a sense of, of, of oneness and a sense of drawing the divine to you. So you have to decide how it, that's going to uh, particularly manifest in your life. And to begin with, I would say don't look to what the world around you is saying that you need to do. But at the same time, I'm saying don't ignore it either. You're going to, we're going to have to find a balance for what's, uh, to what, how we should act in life. And, and all of us want to know what is the right way to behave and act and what should I do. There's an old saying, perhaps you've heard this, it says, uh, it's a great blessing to be born into a religion. It's a misfortune to die in one. Now why? It's a blessing to be born in a religion because we come into a religious uh, belief. If, we, if we're born, we have the karma to, to be good karma to be born into a truly religious spiritual family. This is a great, uh, a great blessing. And a religion, to be born into religion is to Im imply there's a set of beliefs, there's a set of behaviors that each of the religions of this world uh, expound. And if you notice, if you look closely, you'll see there's a commonality. All religions express the need for love. All expressions, uh, uh, religions say that love should be expressed in kindness to other people. All true religions will say that not only in kindness, but we should share. We should, we should be uh, thoughtful of our neighbors. We should uh, be peaceful. We shouldn't take from other, uh, other people, be greedy. Uh, all of these are common behaviors. We should keep ourselves respectable and, and so on. These are, are common because they've been tested over the over the all time, Sanatan Dharma is, is what they are. They're eternal truths, and in the end, truth always wins. If we conform to that which is eternally true, our lives are benefited. We find happiness in life. We find that things work, and this uh, these codes of behavior that are part of all religions can be very helpful in this way, and, and cannot. Be ignored. We cannot make our own rules about life. Some people um, 
uh, like to believe that I can radically make my own standards in life and if I be true to myself and true to my own beliefs, this is the right way to act in life. But as, uh, as uh, it's often been said, well that's maybe true, but can you eat nails? No, you can't eat nails. Uh, you have to uh, you have to eat proper food, and we we just we cannot simply choose to do something because out of a, it's our personal whim. We have to conform to the way we ourselves are made, not just physically, but inwardly. There is certain uh, truths that exist in this world, and of course this is this is not the class or the discourse to go into the reasons why. Uh, discussion of yama, niyama, and so on, but there are things we must conform to. And so, yes, we, we have to behave in a certain way. And if we learn these as a, as a youth, they serve as a proper foundation for our upbringing, our behavior, and our likelihood of being successful outwardly as well as in terms of our happiness will be better assured. But there comes a point in all people's lives where you cannot simply look outside of yourself and follow the rules alone. There comes a point where we have to internalize those rules. Why? Why should I be kind? And understand that from a deeper level. So it's not simply, we're not doing something simply because there's a rule posted on the chalkboard at school. We're doing it because we understand inwardly from our own experience and our own understanding of why it is we should do that. So we, have, we learn to conform from inwardly we begin to act in that way. And this is why we, it's, it's a misfortune to die in a religion, not that we reject that religion, but we go beyond the mere following of external rules. And so we begin to internalize those rules from our own intuitive uh, uh, understanding <coughs> of what's being asked of us. And so this is, this is the direction that all of us must go. Now, when, we, when we're trying to understand in our day-to-day -day life, what is it that we should do? We must uh, look to our inner experience and see what works. And this is the, this when we uh, speak of learning to internalize, it's our experience has to guide us. We understand that it's, if I put my hand on a hot stove, it's going to be burnt. And I learned from that. That you could say that the, the pain is a way of teaching me, teaching all of us, uh, the lessons of life. And so we learn from that experience and slowly I understand I, I'm not going to put my hand in the fire. And little by little then my experience grows. And so this, little, this is how children grow up in life. They learn their lessons and they begin to conform. Now, one of the things that... Uh, beware of is on the one hand we have to we have to internalize these truths and I mentioned we have to also respect the tradition that is being handed down to us but it's so uh, there's a fine line between these two on the respecting side we have to realize that for thousands of years truths have been passed down to us and we must pay attention to that what if you're if you're in a situation where you need to you're trying to decide should i do this should i do this how should i live my life ask the question what's the tradition that's been passed down for thousands of years what is it and then try to understand now why why might it be that way look within meditate on that and then ask yourself what have the great masters said throughout the ages. What did the saints, what did the saints say? Look at the, at the, you know, the, what does the Guru say? And try to understand why. But now you need to take it beyond that though. 
But nevertheless, that's where we must begin. And if what we're doing is counter to what the masters throughout the ages have said, be careful, be careful. There's no new religion. Religion is eternal. Religion is one. As Paramahansa Yogananda said when he was asked by one of his disciples, Sir, is this a new religion? And he responded, No, it's not a new religion. Of course not, but it's a new expression. Religion is expressed throughout the ages in fresh forms so that it reaches the people of the particular time in which that truth is being reintroduced. But the basis of it does not change. Religion does not change. So what did the Master say? What does tradition say? Beware of fads. Many people, uh, uh, a new thing comes up, in, and not necessarily in religion, but sometimes in that too. There's a new wave of mass thinking. Um, all of a sudden, uh, children are playing with a new popular toy. Adults are playing with a new, uh, a new toy in its own form. Perhaps it's a, a, a new diet fad. A new, uh, a new guru comes to town with a new message, a new, uh, a new way of healing. Uh, all of these uh, fads come about and we say, we're f you see people chasing after one then another one comes in a year or two later chasing after another. It's said that in the book trade you're guaranteed to have good sales if every year you come out with a, with a new book on health, on health fads, a way to, way to perhaps lose weight. You can't lose if you write it uh, creatively. Well, if you follow fads, actually, let me, let me back up. There was a, I remember a story uh, at Ananda Village in, in um, Ananda's work. We've had our share of fads pass through our uh, community and people have uh, people being people are susceptible to fads. I remember many years ago, there was a lady, she was a psychic healer, uh, one of those uh, who claimed to have some insight into things. And it was either her or, or another fellow, because there are many of them that came through. She advised people that uh, surrounding us is various radiation. And in order to protect ourselves from the radiation in the world, what we should do is we should is to get a little bag, a small bag, and fill it with asbestos. Now you know asbestos is is not a good thing to uh, to have in your environment. But it put this asbestos in the bag and put it on a string and wear it around your neck, so that you had this asbestos uh, bag around your neck, and this would protect you against some sort of subtle emanations of radiation in the in the environment. And sure enough, within a couple of months of this person, I began to see this person and another person walking around with these silly little bags on their, on their neck. And it was so ridiculous. It was a fad that it passed through and people were susceptible to that. But if it's not that, it's going to be another thing. Now, the thing about fads is what you're doing is you're uh, doing actions that are not of your own discrimination, not of your own discernment. What you're doing is you're subjecting yourself to a mass consciousness that, if repeated often enough, you begin to lose your own power of discerning. Don't do something just because everybody else is doing it. Yogi, a yogi is somebody who inwardly not out of a motivation of ego, but, an, but out of a, motion, uh, a motive of wanting to understand the truth for themselves, who pulls back a little bit from the crowd. Don't follow the crowd. You can almost say that if, if it's believed by a crowd, there's a good chance it may be wrong. Pull back a little bit. And this is why Paramahansa Yogananda had that phrase, that is good to remember. He said, seclusion is the price of greatness. And we take, and by that he meant we need to seclude, not necessarily 
just physically removing ourselves from others, but psychically we have to pull within ourselves a little bit, away from the hustle and bustle and the opinions of the world around us, to go within, to seek that truth for ourselves. What is true and what is not true? And use our own inner experience. And if you don't have inner experience, use your common sense. Does something make sense or does it not make sense? Is it, is it a conformed logic? Uh, logic we know is not the highest way to understand. Intuition is higher than logic. But if you do not have that intuitive perception or understanding, use your common sense, use your logic, and then decide, is this the right thing to do? It is the not the right thing to do. It comes down to us developing our own intuition. But so what we must we begin by uh, understanding what does tradition say? What does the great master say? What does our guru say? And conforming to that, attuning to that, trying to understand it, and if we don't understand it inwardly, then conform to it outwardly. But then go within and from our own intuition try to understand what is being asked of us. What's the right thing to do? There's uh, uh, one of the most, I mentioned, learning from your own practical experience. Well, this is looking for what, what your actions, what is the result of your actions. Do the things that you do in life, if, you've, if you're trying to decide this or that, do they bring good results? You can test yourself. Test your intuition. If you do have an intuition that I should go right or I go left, go. Go right. But go a little bit and test. Uh, and many people, they have intuitive perceptions. They think that uh, my intuition tells me, but they never test it. And you could say sometimes they're uh, hesitant to test it. Because if they actually objectively tested their intuitional insights, they'd be proven wrong. And usually, uh, to the degree that a person is not able to test something, often their belief becomes dogmatic in proportion. And so they're very firm on something that is untestable. Whereas if you can test it, they tend to be more tentative. Isn't it so? You find that because, yo, I might be wrong. And so if you have an intuition, see if you can test it. Is it true? And little by little, it'll begin to grow. Your intuition is like a muscle. And we should use it and develop it like a muscle. And slowly, by the use of the intuition, it will begin to grow and it will begin to clarify. There was a beautiful story from the life of St. Francis. St. Francis, when he first renounced the world and he left his home, uh, in his father's home in the town of Assisi in Italy, he moved, uh, Assisi's on a hillside, and he moved down into the valley below the city. And there he found a run-down, dilapidated, semi-destroyed chapel. A very small little church. And he went there and he stayed at that church and he was there by himself at that time and he prayed and prayed and prayed and God had come to him in vision and, and had inspired him to take this step of to, re, totally renouncing uh, the worldly life and his family and seeking only God and God came to him in vision and told him Francis rebuild my church and now Francis was a young man he was rather simple not he was not unintelligent, but he was as simple of heart. And so hearing God's commandment, rebuild my church, he looked around and he saw this chapel where he was in, and it was totally dilapidated. And so he began, I have a commandment, my intuition, and God has told me. And he began to rebuild that church. He went and he begged for materials from the villagers, and he found stones. And it was very hard work, all by himself. He was he began to do the masonry, and he rebuilt a little church. A little church it's called the Portuncula, 
and you can see it still today. It's been, of course, uh, fixed, you know, more, uh, re renovated, you might say, from those days, but it's still there. And he rebuilt that church very beautifully. Now, as he did so, his vision or his guidance of what he was supposed to do clarified because what God was telling him was, yes, Francis, rebuild my church, but he didn't, God wasn't meaning just that little chapel. Uh, St. Francis is, was certainly, if not the greatest, certainly one of the greatest of the Christian saints in all the 2,000 years. And at that, at that day and age, the church in the larger sense had fallen into a dark time and he renovated, brought new, a new spirit to the Catholic Church, the Christian religion at that time. And it flowered into a, a great renaissance spiritually uh, uh, within the church. But St. Francis didn't know that at that time. He just saw it in terms of that little work that he had been given. But ultimately he did rebuild the church because it was out of him that a great awakening of, of, of heart and spirit uh, flowered within the Catholic Church. And so the point here is, is if we follow our intuition and whatever little guidance that we're given to whatever, to do something, it will begin to grow just like a, uh, like a, a, a channel or a spring. If we begin to clean the spring out, the water flow begins to increase. And so it will be with the guidance that comes to us. But we do have to act on that guidance. We can't receive intuitive guidance and let it sit. We have to actually put that in action. And so use your intuition and take action. So the question of what is right action, remember there's two, two parts there. The right, which is the guidance, and the second is the action. We also have to put it in action. And sometimes that will take courage. But take one step at a time. Don't be presumptuous. You, get, you receive guidance, and the guidance may be to go straight. Go straight. But it, the guidance may be go straight for a while, then take a right or take a left. And if you continue just to go straight, maybe you go over the cliff. So you have to continually keep asking and little by little the guidance will clarify and the guidance will grow. As you're doing this, don't allow yourself in terms of guidance to become superstitious. This, you might say that I think that asbestos bag on people <laughs> where it was superstitious. Maybe it had some reality, I don't know, but I always thought it was some bit of a superstition. And you, often people approach guidance in a very superstitious way. Fellow goes to church or to temple. You go to temple and you walk out of the temple and you break your arm. Fell down the steps, break your arm. The guidance, that must mean I shouldn't go to the temple. Look what happened when I went to the temple. I broke my arm. That's superstition. You know, it, it, it had nothing to do with that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go to the temple in the future. We, we have to use the guidance on, a, 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 on an inner level and not allow what happens to us outside become superstition. And you see this very, very frequently in religion. Something, two things will happen completely independent of each other and people will see a cause and effect relationship between the two which doesn't exist. Now there may be an existence to it, but just to merely believe it without an intuitive wisdom of that being so, that's when it becomes superstition. It just, it's like belief, but belief based not upon experience. Faith is belief, is belief that has been tested by experience. So consequently, if you go to temple and a hundred people walk out of the church and they all break their arm, well, it does may not mean to, that they shouldn't go to the temple, but maybe they should look at the steps and see why the people are falling when they come out of the temple. Maybe that might be a better solution. Anyway, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. The, uh, uh, when you look within yourself to find what is the, what is the right thing to do, intuition, 
Look to the results. Do your, do your actions produce harmony? Do they produce disharmony? Uh, it's very simple. Sometimes uh, you can test in that way. What is the fruits of your action? Good actions should produce good fruit. Certainly there should be a sense of elevation in, your, in, in what you do. But nevertheless, even there, it's subtle. Jesus Christ, he drove the money changers out of the temple. And obviously that was, uh, uh, you could say, oh, that seemed like disharmony at the time. But yet there was a higher calling to that. So even there, you have to be careful. Man is uh, like, in, it can be compared to being in a labyrinth. The labyrinth is, is very windy. A crooked, a crooked path. And so you'll see people, if you're above the labyrinth, some will be going left, some will be going right, some up, some down. But ultimately, all of them are seeking the same end, which is the inner freedom from the labyrinth. Very simple way to, uh, I should mention, that you're looking to find what is right action. You don't, you, your intuition is not being able to guide you you're uh, a little bit uncertain, ask advice of other people. Those people who you respect. Those people who are wise. Those people perhaps who have a little bit more experience than you. If you want to go up the mountain and you're not quite sure which is the best way to go, why not ask a guide? Obviously this, is, this could lead into a discussion of why have a guru. These, these are the uh, something very simple, going outside of ourselves to ask. And then we begin through our own experience to, to learn, yes, that is the right path to take. Now on a uh, little bit more inward answer, if you have questions, what should I do, Lord? Should I go left? Should I go right? Should I do this? Should I do that? Go into meditation. Go in, become silent. Try to still the outward tumult, the outward disturbance of your life, and go slowly and silently within and ask that question. And broadcast that question to the divine from the point between the eyebrows. Focus your question Lord, I need an answer. What should I do? Guide me, guide me. And broadcast that request for guidance to God from the point between the eyebrows in total concentration, trying to still the restless mind as you do so. Then, after you have done that for a little bit of time, then focus your attention here at the heart and try to feel in the stillness in the calm center here, try to feel God's response. Now, you may want to pose your question to God, should I, in terms of options, should I do A, should I do B? And hold each of those options up to the, to, up to the divine. If you can see the light at the point between the eyebrows, hold them up to the light. And how does that feel versus how does that feel? And feel it here in the heart. Now, as you do so, watch for a few signs. Are you excited? Oh, that feels right. Did, that, did you become excited? If you did, be careful. Does it feel right, but you're very calm? There's true intuitive guidance is, a deep, is accompanied by a deep calmness. Does it feel, is it expansive or is it, uh, you might say, uh, contractive? Does it, does it serve others? Is, is there a sense of love and rightness come to it? Go in that direction. Now, these are very subtle. Go in that direction, but it does not mean go all the way to the end because you need to go in that direction. And as you begin to take action, you'll begin to draw 
more intuitive guidance if you ask. And so you'll find this to be true that start your project if it's a is, is start your project and slowly slowly you'll do the next thing that seems to be the right thing. You might ask yourself what is the next positive thing that I can do in the present circumstances. Let me know one thing that will be helpful and do that and then ask the question again. What is the one, one positive thing I can do in this present situation and do that and do that even if they're very small and then slowly you'll begin to be guided. There is a wonderful passage in the autobiography of a yogi in the chapter where Paramahansa Yogananda uh, receives cosmic, uh, experience in cosmic consciousness from his guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar. If you remember the story, Yogananda is meditating and he is, his guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, is upstairs in the bedroom up above and he calls uh, to uh, Mukunda, uh, come up to his bedroom. And Makunda is meditating and Sri Teshwar calls a couple of times and Yogananda writes that he was a little bit disturbed by this and he says, Sir, I'm meditating. And he calls back and his guru calls back to him. He says, I know how you're meditating. There is, in other words, his mind was wandering. He says, come up. And Yogananda realizing that his guru was all knowing and knew exactly uh, what was uh, going in, on in his mind, went up to his guru's bedroom and his guru says, poor boy, you know, that uh, was feeling sorry for him. And as the story goes, he touched him and he gave him that experience with Samadhi and he went into that state and he describes it in that chapter. Well, after that was over, Swami uh, Sri Yukteswar taps him again and he comes back into this day-to-day -day consciousness away from Samadhi and he then asks his guru, he says, Sir, when will I find God? And his guru smilingly or laughingly says, You weren't expecting, were you, to, to encounter an older, an elder gentleman with flowing beard uh, uh, in, this, in your quest for God? And, of course, Yogananda was not, but then Sri uh goes on to explain that ever-expanding joy, ever-expanding, ever-new, sat-chit-ananda, ever-conscious, ever-existing, ever-new bliss is the divine that we're all seeking. And so Yogananda says, ah, sir, now I understand that whenever I can subconsciously or consciously recall the joy of God in my daily life, in the, in the midst of my activities, whenever I can bring it back in the midst of all my activities, I find, I will find myself, I find myself guided to the right action in all circumstances even in the details, and I like that, those last words, even in the details. So you see what he was saying here, the secret of right action is to recall the joy of God and then in the moment and all actions will be guided to the highest if we act in that consciousness. Now, not just on the level of an affirmation, even though maybe that's where we have to start, but in the reality of being in the light of God, in the joy of God, in the Om of God, acting in that consciousness, we are in a flow of divine grace. And in that divine grace, action motivated and in that flow of grace must be in tune with divine will. Because we're, we're, we're in that will, you could say. And so action in that state is guided 
even in the details. And somehow everything is for the best. And this is what each of us want to strive for. Act in God. Act in the flow of God. Act in God's grace. But to be able to do that, we must invite that grace into our lives. We must learn to experience that grace. We must learn to be able, at will, to put ourselves into that grace. We hold our cup up, which is our job to do in life, is to hold our cup up to the flow of that grace and be able to receive it. And when we receive that, that's what our heart has been longing for. That is the pathway of inner freedom. That is where all of us are ultimately destined to go. And if we can act in that way and receive that guidance in that way, if receive the joy of God, then act in that, jo in that joy. We'll find ourselves doing right action. So outwardly, there's many things that we all need to do our best if we understand, and which I, I do, not all of us, we can, it's, not, uh, it's not easy for all of us to be able to be in that state at all times, but to the degree that we can rise up to it, do, try, and then do your best. Sincerity of heart, of trying to do the best right action, it counts. Sometimes you may not do the right action, but if you're sincere and you're truly trying to please God, because remember, that is our duty first, God first, and in that desire to please God, then expressing that outward in however you are inspired to do, to the degree that you can help others and expand that feeling of joy, you'll find that that joy will increase. So naturally, you want, to, you want to act in that grace, but then the natural impulse will be to share that grace with other people, uplifting them as you can, helping them as you can, embracing them in that joy as you can. Many blessings to all of you.